All right, if you would, open in your Bibles if you got them, or turn on your phones. <laughs> Hebrews 11 will be kind of a base for us this morning, but we're going to jump all over the place most likely. Why don't we pray God's blessing on this time in His Holy Word, and we'll see what God has to say through it to us today. Father, we come to you now and we ask for your Holy Spirit's presence and blessing upon this time in your Word. I pray that we would come to fully understand and accept what true faith in Christ is and how it's necessary and how it comes from you. And so, Lord, I pray for all of the divine help and assistance I need, Lord, to just say what you would have me to say, what you have already declared, and that, Lord, you would give us ears to hear what you're saying and hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title this morning is Faith in America, and it's not not getting into all this political um, slant, but what I want to do is take a little survey of faith in America and what it looks like. One of our contemporary politicians made this statement. Our national motto, In God We Trust, reminds us that faith in our Creator is the most important American value of all. And I wouldn't disagree with him, but faith today takes on many different forms and meanings to many different people. In America today, everybody has a faith of some sort. People even say, I have my faith and you have your faith, as if all faiths are equal. And it's an interesting thing that has happened in our culture. Even atheists have a faith. Many won't claim it, but they have a belief about God. Either he doesn't exist or he does. But everybody has a belief system and a faith from which they live their everyday life. And this faith system either matches reality or it doesn't. For the atheist, their faith may be in the universe itself, maybe in science or human reason, Maybe it's in their own goodness or faith in the absence of God altogether. But in reality, when you look at all the evidence for God's existence, and there is a vast amount of evidence for God's existence, it takes more faith to believe that He doesn't exist than to believe that He actually does. You actually have to teach kids to be atheists. Nobody's born an atheist. Nobody looks at the world around them and goes, Wow, this all happened by accident. Kids go, who made this? How did I get here? How did we get here? Why are we here? Those are natural life questions that every human being asks. You have to actually be taught not to ask those questions. See, the truth is, most people that I've ever encountered who reject God and specifically a belief in Jesus Christ, they do so not on intellectual grounds, but emotional. They'll claim an intellectual reason, but it's always hiding their true emotional reason. There's oftentimes a great tragedy in their own life. Trauma or disappointment or loss that has spun them into a way to, that, to believe that there is a good God who is in control of all things and has a plan for their life. When something bad happens, it's hard for them to accept faith in a God who is good. And so that's something that we have to overcome when we look at the issue of faith, specifically faith in Jesus. But in America today, 80% of Americans believe in God. That's four out of every five people that you encounter. But we have to actually get to the specifics because 56% of those 80 believe in God as described in the Bible. 23% believe in some other higher power or force. If you think like Star Wars, the idea that the force is with you, some impersonal force that is guiding all of human history. But out of the 19 or 20% that do not believe in God, there's the 9% who believe in a spiritual force or higher power. So if you clump together those who say they believe in God, but he's a spiritual force with those who don't believe in God, but they believe in a spiritual force. That's 33% of Americans believe that. Some impersonal force out there that's guiding their life. But then you get to the 10% who claim that there is no God and they don't believe in a higher power. 
It's only one in ten people in America. So faith is actually very popular. Many people have a general faith in God. And oftentimes, if you ask the normal American, do you believe in God? Four out of every five will say, yeah, I believe in God. And we accept that as, okay, good. We're all on the same page. We're all on the same team. But we have some really interesting statements about faith. I've got some faith-based quotes for you. One of which says this. Believe in yourself. Have faith in your abilities. Without a humble but reasonable confidence in your own powers, you cannot be successful or happy. Norman Vincent Peale. This faith is a self-centered feel. Uh, faith. Faith in your abilities. In your own powers. Let me ask you, what ability do you have when your life is over to determine where you're going? Do you have the ability to determine the outcome of your life even or your outcome of today? You can influence it, but at the end of the day, you are not in control of the beating of your heart nor the breathing of your lungs. You do not know what tomorrow or later today holds, but faith in your own powers gets you nowhere. This one is, life is full of happiness and tears. Be strong and have faith. Karina Kapoor Khan. Have faith in what? She doesn't tell us. But that same person said, I do my own thing and I believe what I do is the right thing. Is that not an American idea of morality? I do, the, I do my own thing and what I do I believe is the right thing. Do you know what happens if every driver behind an automobile uh, vehicle has that same philosophy of driving? It's called the Philippines. <laughs> I just got back from there a few months ago. They have road signs, they have, they have stop signs, they have traffic lights. They're all a suggestion. <laughs> Nobody, if you want to drive over a medium to get to where you need to go, there was a medium by our hotel. We drove over every day to get to the parking lot of the hotel. Everybody's doing everything. You know what happens? Chaos. There is so much traffic in Manila that they have told people that if your license plate starts in a zero, you cannot drive your car in Manila on Tuesdays. And if it starts in a one, you can't drive on Wednesdays. Guess how good that's worked for them. All they do is buy a car that starts in a different number. So now they got more cars on the road and more traffic. It would take us two hours to go five miles. You see, when you disobey the laws of the land, it's dangerous, it has bad consequences for you, and it causes your whole life to be delayed. What do you think going against God's law does? The same thing and worse. So we need a specific faith. Uh, Steve Jobs said this, sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> faith in what? His is a optimistic general faith. Believe that life is going to get better because life is going to get better. That's something in logic they call circular reasoning. How do you know things are going to get better? If God doesn't exist and He doesn't care for you, guess what? What do you have to stand on that life is going to get better? Or that somebody's going to help you get through this insurmountable obstacle before you? The belief in an all-loving, all-powerful God that makes good things out of horrible circumstances is the only reason why Christians like us can have faith in the worst of circumstances. Because our God takes the worst circumstances and brings good and glory out of it. Amen? What about um, without faith, nothing's, nothing is, is possible. With it, nothing is impossible. That's true if it's the right kind of faith. My basic argument this morning is against the American idea of faith and as long as you believe in God that's good because here's the reality there's a lot of weird beliefs out there now I might have a unique belief or faith in gravity your view of gravity may be that whatever comes up must come down I may say no if I throw something in the air it's just gonna stay up on its own I don't believe in gravity and I decide that I'm going to test my theory by walking off this rodeo arena roof. Is it okay for me to have a faith like that? 
I have the freedom believe, to believe that, but what are the consequences for my life? Death. My faith does not match reality. And many people today have a general faith in God that does not match who God really is and how He has revealed Himself to mankind. It has to be a clear, true, and specific faith. If I put my faith and trust in this pulpit to hold my weight, and if I put all my weight on it, it will get very small, very fast. It will not be able to hold the weight and girth of my body. Some people, their faith system is like this pulpit, and they want it to hold all of their mistakes, all of their hopes, all of their dreams, their life, and they put it on it, and it will collapse and crush. You see, I could put, I genuinely put all my hope and faith in this pulpit, but it does not have the power or strength to hold me up, to save me. The only person who has that power to save you and me is Jesus Christ, and that's what we're talking about today. So we're going to talk about what is faith. We're going to talk about is it necessary, and what does faith actually look like. Turn to James 2.19 with me, please. James 2.19. We're told in God's Word very clearly if a general faith in some God out there is enough. James 2.19. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So if we accept what the Bible says, that there is a spiritual reality out there and a physical reality, that there are forces of darkness and evil that exist, they believe in God's existence. Satan and all his forces of darkness know that God exists. They have a general faith in God, but they don't have a faith that leads to trust and obedience in God Almighty. They disobey Him. So they believe He exists, but they live against Him and His will. I believe one of the best examples of what real faith and trust is, I heard from the guy who runs our junior high ministry named Eddie. He, was, he had a pool party at his house, and since we have two junior hires now, we were there, and he shared a real life story about the first guy to ever tightrope walk Niagara Falls. So I looked it up because I didn't want to get it wrong and I want to give him credit because I heard it from him. But the guy's name was Charles Blondin. And in 1860, he was the first guy to go 11,000 feet on this tightrope from New York to Canada, 160 feet above the rapids. He tightrope walked it normally with that long pole first. He didn't only do it once, but he did it many times, each time making it more difficult carrying something with him. The first time he went over in a sack. Then he went over on stilts. Then he rode a bicycle. Then he did it in the dark. And then he did it blindfolded. One time he even carried a stove over and cooked an omelet in the middle. This guy was amazing. There was crowds on either side and they would erupt in just applause as he would reach the other side. And then one day he pushed a wheelbarrow with a sack of potatoes in it across. The crowd on the other side exploded in applause and he suddenly stopped, touched the crowd and said, do you believe I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? The crowd enthusiastically yelled, yes, we believe. And he said, who's my first volunteer? Nobody got in. What does that say about their faith? We believe. And many people today in America are like, we believe, but will we trust Jesus and get in the wheelbarrow with him? See, the reality is this. Jesus is the only one who's ever gone from one side of eternity to the other side and come back and said, I'm going to take you across. And your choice is you can try to get to the other side of eternity on your own ability and merits. And guess what? You don't have the ability to be good enough to make it across to the other side. Jesus, however, proved that he did. He rose again from the grave after dying on the cross. And then he made it across and he keeps coming back offering rides. 
And it's only the person who says, you know what? I know I need to get to the other side, but if I try, I'm going to perish. And if I stay on this side, I'm going to perish. So Jesus, you are my only hope. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except by me. There was only one Charles Blondin who took people over on a wheelbarrow. Unfortunately, nobody trusted him. Nobody had enough faith. Today, do you have enough faith to trust Jesus with your life? Or are you going to try to make it across to the other side on your own? You see, even the biblical words for faith in Hebrew and Greek means more than just an intellectual belief in the existence of God. The Hebrew word is aman, and it means to prop or support like the doorposts on a house. Without those supports, the house will crumble. And your faith is the pillar and support of your life. And either it's a good pillar and support or it's a faulty support that will crumble when you need it to stand up. Is faith necessary? A specific faith in Jesus. God answered it for us in the first commandment. It's interesting that our nation was founded on the Ten Commandments, the greatest law ever given given to all humanity. You cannot look through the history books and find a greater set of commandments than the Ten Commandments that tell us how to love God and love our neighbor. The first commandment, God tells us specifically who He is. He doesn't say believe in God and have many gods or just pick one God. He says this in Exodus 20 verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He is specifically saying, you know, the guy who saved you from the Egyptians, who brought you through the Red Sea on dry land, I'm that God. And guess what? You are not allowed to worship any other God but me. Now, is that egotistical and selfish for God to require you and I to worship, worship Him only? I don't know. Is it selfish or egotistical for me to want and expect my wife to love me only in a special love relationship? Or should I allow her to have other husbands? I'm not taking a poll. Like, it's not an option. Um, no, it is only between me and her. It is not selfish. And it's not selfish for my kids for me to tell them, look, your mom and I, we chose you. We adopted you. We are your only dad and mom. We love you. You are ours. We made you our own. God made you ours. Is it selfish for us to think, I'm your dad? So if God made you, why would it be wrong for him to say, hey, don't worship and go after false gods. I'm the only one who's ever saved anybody. Don't get tricked. Don't get deceived. Anybody good at deceiving themselves? Please shake your head yes. We are so good at convincing ourselves that something wrong is right and something right is wrong. My kids are experts, right? But the reality is this. God said, you shall have no other gods before me. I am the only true God. And see, in the time of Old Testament Israel and New Testament church, everybody believed in God. It was a pagan culture. They believed in all kinds of gods. So the issue of that day was the right God, the one true God, the one who gave His only Son to die on the cross for you and me. So what does faith look like in your life and mine? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm just going to read several verses for you because I want you to see what real faith in the one true God looks like in the life of human beings like you and me. To get some blood flowing... Before we wrap it up, we're going to stand in honor of God's Word, and I'm going to read Hebrews 11, 1 through about 10, give or take a few. Verse 1 says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, people of old received their commendation or their approval from God. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. 
Go on to verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. You can be seated. Now, based on all those verses, we see that faith is the substance or evidence of things unseen. A lot of people think seeing is believing, but the reality is, even in Jesus' day, people said, if God would do this, I would believe. And Jesus makes a lame man who was born lame walk. A guy who was born blind now see. A dead man come to life. Guess what? People saw and people still didn't believe. Because the reality is, seeing is not believing. Believing is actually seeing. Faith in the one true God opens your eyes and takes away those biases you and I have against a loving God who wants you to know Him. Jen and I just watched a movie this week. It's on Netflix. You can catch it. It's The Case for Christ. And if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. I read this book years ago, and it's a true life story of an investigative journalist, award-winning, named Lee Strobel, and he worked for the Chicago Tribune. And his wife ended up coming to faith in Christ, and he was not happy about it. And he ended up setting out, as many have throughout human history, to try to discredit the claims of the Bible, specifically the resurrection of Jesus. Because one of his co-workers, who was a Christian, said, if you can prove that Jesus did not raise from the dead, then all Christianity says doesn't matter. It all hinges on the resurrection. If he did, however, raise from the dead, then everything Christianity says is absolutely true. So he sets out, he investigates it, tries to be biased, but he's totally not. He's not liking what he's finding through all the experts. And he ends up going to see a man in the hospital who he, because of an article he wrote, that man was falsely accused and sentenced to 15 years in prison as a snitch and a, shoot, a cop killer, a cop shooter. He ends up, before he gets transferred, getting brutally beaten, almost dies. So now he's in the hospital. Lee Strobel realized he was responsible for what happened. So he goes to see the guy in the hospital and he says, with tears in his eyes, I'm sorry, this is all my fault. And the guy looks at him and he says, you didn't see the truth because you didn't want to see the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, none of us are unbiased. Every one of us either has a reason why we don't want to believe in Christ or a reason why we do want to. But we have to sometimes look at the evidence. And the reality is the evidence for Christ and that God exists and He loves you and He sent His only begotten Son, that is a smart, reasonable faith based on historical record, archaeological evidence, and the evidence of God's work in people's lives today and throughout all of human history. You can't find a better foundation for your faith than in Jesus Christ. He is the only true foundation for your life and mine. So how does Hebrews wrap this up? I want you to read with me chapter 12, verse 1. There's three things faith does. Faith drops weight. Faith runs the race and faith looks to Jesus. And I'm going to give you an example from the life of my two oldest kids, Joey and Haven, to really put together for us what faith in Jesus looks like. Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we just read in Hebrews 11 about all these great men and women of faith. 
They are the witnesses of human history who have lived and put their faith and trust in Christ. He said, since there are witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. How many of you are carrying around extra weight in your life? You're like, physically, we're all like, yep, that's me. Um, when I, you know, competed in athletics, wrestling was really my sport. Obviously, I'm not a basketball player based on my physique. But wrestling, at the highest level, you had to trim off and cut weight to get down to your leanest, best fighting weight. It was not a fun process, but it was painful, it took discipline, and it took dedication. If you did not cut that weight, you were disqualified. You couldn't compete. And so often in life, you and I are carrying so much extra weight and baggage, bearing us down spiritually. And some of you today are going, I just can't do it anymore. My life is heavy. I can't handle these issues and these needs others have around me or my own needs. And you start to feel like somebody treading water with a hundred pound weight. What do you have to do to continue treading water or to make it to the edge of the pool? You got to let go of the weight. Jesus said, if you are weary and heavy laden, give your burdens to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Give it up to Jesus as we sang. Give it all to Him. Faith drops weight. It lets go of sinful behaviors and lifestyles that are weighing us down. But the reality is we're scared to do that. I have a Mustang horse named Legend. The guy is amazing. He's just like me. Not amazing, but short, stocky, and rebellious by nature. That stinking horse, I'm working with him. And the first time we got him out on trail, we came to a red curb. And I've shared this story before. And that three-inch curb looked to him like it was a 400-foot chasm that we were going to fall down and die if he crossed it. And so I'm trying to convince him, buddy, it's okay. We can make it across. And he's freaked out. And our neighbors, Mark and Missy, Mark's the uh, awesome looking uh, bass player up here. They do a thing called Jim Gymkhana, which is obstacle courses with horses. And they go through all these different obstacles and horses by nature spook and fearful. They're, they're, they're frightful in strange circumstances. So if that horse doesn't trust its rider, it's going to come up on an obstacle and it's going to spook and throw them off, run away, and they can be a danger to themselves and others. And many of us are like those type of horses who don't trust. They don't want to trust their master and their creator to get them over and through the obstacles in our life. We just see them and we freak out. Amen. Thank you. And, and we, we don't know how to get by these things until we trust the one who created us, our master, the rider who can take us through these obstacles. But faith also runs with endurance, the race set out for us. Do you know that God's word tells you and I that God planned your life from the beginning to the end? You're like, man, he has a bad plan. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Because sometimes those bad and difficult circumstances are the things that will lead you to a saving faith in Jesus and true joy and freedom in Him. He uses all means to draw us to Him. But lastly, look at what it says in verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. You cannot be perfect in faith and you cannot perfect your faith your faith is in the one who can perfect it for you. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So, faith gets rid of excess weight. When we confess our sin, Jesus promises to take it away. He's the only one who could forgive you and I of our sins. And we've all blown it. I don't need to convince you of that. We've all made mistakes and done things that God doesn't approve of and we don't approve of. God can wipe that all away in Christ. He's the only one who can do that. Secondly, faith enables you to run the race and the life God has created for you. 
But lastly, faith looks to Jesus. It's interesting, when Joey and Haven were about three or four years old, we lived in Orange, and we had a little house there. And Jen and I were playing with both of them in the yard, and we were throwing a ball around. And of course, Joey hucks it onto the roof, right? He's just excited, and he throws it. And I go, okay, buddy, I'm going to take you. I'm going to put you up on the roof. Now, our roof was literally at the edge, was maybe nine feet tall, maybe even eight. And I'm not that tall, and I could easily get him up there. So he's a little nervous. Yeah, he's three or four years old. So I put him up on the roof, and he's fine. And he gets up there, he grabs the ball, he turns to throw it off, and he freezes. And his little legs are shaking. He's like, Dad, Daddy, buddy, it's okay. He could see me. I'm right here. Just walk to the edge, and he's like, he gets to the edge. He forgot about the ball. He just dropped it and it rolled off. And he's there. And I'm like, buddy, dad's right here. Jump. And he's like, no, no, no. Uh -uh. And he's starting to well up with tears. And I'm like, buddy, I have literally thrown that kid 14 feet in the air and caught him every time. Like he would go way higher laughing and giggling. Dad has never dropped him. But he's so scared, right? And so he gets, and after quite some time, I finally get him and he gets down to where he's almost sitting and he goes, and the fall was literally a foot. That's all he fell. Just like legend in that red curb, when I finally got him to walk over it, it was literally four inches. And he's like, oh, you know, and that's how Joey's and I caught him. And he hung onto my neck like he just, you know, life-threatening circumstance. And, but then Haven, she goes, daddy, daddy, I want to do it. So I take Haven, I throw her up there. She looks around and she, I'm like, okay, Haven, when I say, and she's already coming to the edge and she does this. She closes her eyes and goes. <laughs> Just reckless abandon, no hesitation. Daddy, catch me. And see, some of us are like that. Maybe from an early age, like you just, you knew God, you wanted to know Him, you continued to live for Him, and you were just that person who was like, you, and you go and you know your Heavenly Father is going to catch you. But then you might be like Joey, who just by nature was a little more hesitant. But once he trusts, he's all in. And that's how Joey is, but it took him time, and it took him knowing that it's scary. Like to let go and fall for a moment, that's unnerving. And for somebody who doesn't know Christ and maybe you've spent your whole life not wanting to know Him, that's a scary step. But when you realize that it's only that red curb, it's only a, a foot and God's track record for catching people, He's never dropped a kid, Right? He's not that dad who sees your kid like, oh, let me play with them. And they throw them and they start walking away. <laughs> They're not that dad. They're the one who never has dropped anybody in all of human history. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will be safe in your father's arms. But then there's a third type of person. They get up on the roof of life and their heavenly father's calling them, but they've gone up to the peak and they can't see him, and they're going, where, where, where do I go? I'm stuck. I don't know where to go. And God the Father's like, yeah, I'm right down here. Come to the edge. And they're like, but I don't, and they get stuck all their life, not knowing where to go. They're imprisoned, and they're living their life on this little square of tragedy and self-deception and discouragement and they don't know where they're going to go when their life is over and yet God their loving father is saying just come to the edge I'm going to catch you so who are you today are you Haven Woo! who just goes for it well you will find that God is your safe Haven if you trust him today or maybe you needed some coercing and you're like Joey. But once you look at the evidence and the truth, you realize there is nobody else qualified to catch you and keep you safe. Or you're that person stuck on the roof, scared to come to the edge. I'm telling you, the only way to get off that place where you're at in life is to trust the only one who loves you. Jesus keeps going back and forth from this part, side of eternity to the other, bringing people to the other side. But do you have the faith 
to trust him to take you to heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to have Damascus Roadkill come on up and uh, finish off another song as God works in our hearts. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, for your truth, that it's not a general, general faith, that it's not all faiths are true, but Lord, logic dictates that only one faith and one God can be true. And so we look to you as the one true God who sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins and proved its sufficiency by him rising from the dead for us so that we, when death comes knocking, we can rise again to eternal life with you. We thank you, God, for that cross and that testimony that we can have eternal life through faith in Jesus. And in your name we pray. Amen.